Good morning uh, and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we're just going to give it a minute for everyone to join the session. So thank you for your patience. Good morning and good afternoon for those who are just joining. We're just going to give it uh, a moment just for everyone to load into the session. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa Berry, and I am the principal and co-founder at IR Labs, an investor relations advisory firm based in Vancouver, British Columbia. We are pleased to welcome you to 3H Properties' third live fireside chat and Q&A. Please note that this session is being recorded. 3H Properties Group is a Canadian developer changing the affordable housing industry for the better. 3H Properties' goal is to develop 100% affordable housing while creating long-term investment opportunities through partnerships with nonprofits and institutions to secure and develop land in secondary markets across Canada. 3H Properties has come to recognize the importance of optimization versus maximization of existing affordable housing stock holds to achieving their goal. This includes seeking ways to ensure housing affordability, quality of life for tenants, health and wellness through building design, environmental and energy solutions, innovative construction techniques, and how to achieve a reasonable and fair return for investors. This webinar will feature Canadian affordable housing experts offering a platform to discuss perspectives on optimization versus maximization of affordable housing in terms of building design, sustainability, and investor return. Today, we hope to glean knowledge and best practices from their unique perspectives to help tackle the current housing crisis. I am now going to uh, introduce our, our special guest today. Uh, first, we have our CEO and founding partner of 3H Properties, Alfredo Hermano. Alfredo's uh, own experience as an immigrant child within a family who relied on community and affordable housing to thrive and succeed in life. Uh, substan uh, he has had substantive time in the construct construction industry and his unique abilities to build teams in a very collaborative way. Alfredo started 3H Properties Group which is focused on 100% affordable housing and growing what he hopes will be a movement to change rental housing for the better. We also have with us Bob Drizis, Vice President of Financing Affordable Housing Specialist at Peak Hill Capital. Bob's knowledge of the financing structures available for construction and term loans in this sector will allow for speed to market and can mitigate execution risk for, for clients looking to deliver affordable rental projects. He has over 30 years of experience in the commercial real estate industry, both in the public and private sector. As a principal in several private equity platforms, Bob has been involved in the ownership of over a billion dollars in real estate across the country. His background in transaction management, asset management, and financing has allowed him to develop many transferable skills applicable to the affordable housing sector. Bob is a graduate of U of T with a major in urban and economic geography. We also have with us Jeff Thomas, Group Head Development at Kingset Capital. Jeff leads Kingset's development group and is responsible for the visioning and execution of Kingset's development business. Prior to Kingset, Jeff was the managing partner at Ashler Urban, a commercial real estate brokerage firm, which was sold to Cushman and Wakefield in 2017. Jeff holds the BA in public administration uh, and public policy from the University of Western Ontario and an HBA from Richard Ivey School of Business. Jeff is a member of YPO and is actively involved in several, several charitable organizations. And finally, it's our pleasure to have Jordan Hogendam, president of Zon Engineering. Jordan is a professional engineer in Ontario who's dedicated to educating people, both professionally and in his volunteering and personal activities about solar energy and sustainable building design. With a catalog of award-winning projects, Zon was built on the ethics of environmental responsibility, social justice, and professional integrity. Jordan leads a team of dedicated professionals focused on developing high-quality solutions rooted in a pragmatic understanding of the technologies, systems, and approaches to sustainable building design. 
Following today's presentation, a recording will be made available and we'll be pleased to answer any additional questions anyone may have. As a matter of housekeeping for today's webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box on your screen. And with that, I will now turn it over to Alfredo. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and welcome everybody. Uh, today, I'm very happy to, to be here with our guests, Bob, uh, Jeff, and Jordan. Thank you, for, thank you very much for being here with us. I want to start this webinar today off by speaking about the theme of optimization versus maximization. In March earlier this year, we held an affordable housing webinar with the industry expert, Jonathan Rose. Jonathan is a thoughtful and progressive developer out of New York, whose firm is one of the largest acquirers of affordable housing and mixed income housing in the United States. During the webinar, Jonathan said, oftentimes the real estate industry is focused on maximization, i.e. the maximization of returns, number of units, et cetera. But, Jonathan prefers to use the word optimization, which inspired this webinar. He referenced how poorly designed housing and neighborhood conditions have, shown, have been shown to have harmful effects on a wide range of outcomes, including health. A powerful moment for myself that stuck with me was his reference that children, children who grow up in the least affordable zip codes statistically live 20 years fewer than those who grow up in the healthier zip codes. That's 20 years fewer. This highlights the importance of affordable housing and is key to stability and better health of our communities. Next slide, please. Now I wanna discuss an article that was in the Toronto Star last May. The title reads, Profit and Affordable Housing Don't Mix, Period, by David Olive, columnist. In this article, the Canada Research Chair in Urban Studies at the University of Waterloo was cited stating, the crux of the housing problem is that it is both a basic human right and a commodity from which to extract a profit. David Olive goes on to say, left to their own devices, for-profit developers revert to the mean, which is profit maximization. Furthermore, he says, that is why the instrument of making an abundant affordable housing a reality is government and its nonprofit partners in housing. The free market cannot do it, will not do it, and it must be done. I disagree that that's the only way uh, and believe that morality and investment are not mutually exclusive. What I believe is that the solution of affordable housing is identifying partnerships with private entities and nonprofits that are focused on optimization over maximization. We know that nonprofits are looking out for individuals, tenants, and for profit organizations are often concerned with fiscal sustainability of the projects. This strikes a, a great balance between these go two goals and will help us achieve affordable housing for all, leading to safer, greener, more stable, affordable housing and much better health. Next slide, please. But optimization is multifaceted and it doesn't only have to do with ROIs. It's critical that we optimize every aspect of affordable housing to make the maximum impact on industry, but also communities and the environment. This can take form in many ways, including innovative construction techniques. That's such as lowering waste and carbon and uh, using such uh, things as low carbon concrete and asphalt, uh, robotics, uh, um, AI and, and other things such as printed buildings, air quality and energy programs like Passive House, which we'll talk a little bit more later. Uh, companies have looked to utilize solar, geothermal, wind panels, heat pumps, heat recovery systems like capturing heat from waste, green home building practice and decarbonization. Such things like fixing windows, fi fixing window leaks, solar film, improved insulation, routine air filter changes, uh, turning fans turning fans on during hot weather and, and raising thermostats, uh, LED lights, just to name a few. Unique financing models, such as rent to own, real estate as a digital financial asset to trade, uh, co-ownership, and last but not least, social and community programs, like community gardens addressing food insecurity while also strengthening the community and improving quality of life. 
Now I'd like to start off our moderated session with our esteemed guests. So first question, one of the themes that is essential for optimization of affordable housing developments is health and wellness. This also means that affordable housing developments could align with public investments in job creation, skill training, transit, early learning, healthcare, cultural and recreational infrastructure. However, this, is, this often comes with a big price and most of the focus is on large urban centers. Jordan, can you start us off and speak about how building design process keeps health and wellness at the forefront? For sure, yeah, thank you. So um, when we're looking at these spaces and specifically with affordable housing, um, there's this uh, challenge that we have in terms of developing an affordable model that's not just capital cost affordable, but also operating cost affordable. Um, and part of that, it's really important to understand how the occupants are interacting with the space, how they're using the space, um, and most importantly, providing a space that's that's healthy and will support you know long-term objectives in terms of um, uh, health and wellness uh, within that. And so what that means is looking at how we construct um, the building envelope, the enclosure, uh, air tightness, managing ventilation, ensuring there's adequate ventilation, um, and probably most importantly, understanding what materials are going into the building uh, to ensure that we're not um, putting materials in that could off gas and de detrimentally impact the health of, uh, of building occupants. And so there's you know this inherent trade-off, and this gets into the optimization piece between energy efficiency and, and high levels of energy efficiency um, and providing a good, healthy indoor environment quality. So it's um, it's a, it's a key piece of the design to really ensure that the thermal comfort, the fresh air, um, the low emitting materials are built into the the building and built into the model, um, and not done as an after sort of after effect. Well, I appreciate that, Jeff. Do you have any comments on on that uh, on building design? Yeah, I mean. You know, we, we undertake a, a, a number of different uh, development activities, you know, and ownership activities that might, you know, be considered adjacent to this discussion, but maybe we'll stick to, to the affordable housing side of what we've been planning on doing. And, you know, our affordable housing fund, you know, which has institutional partners, really what the vision for that was is to, you know, develop the best type of product you know, that has, you know, the best communities and that, you know, has scalable economics so that we can deliver, you know, thousands of new units and not dozens of new units. And so, um, you know, despite the headwinds of, you know, in significantly increased construction costs and inflating financing, you know, we've, we've held true to the best product theory, which in our minds is, you know, zero carbon, you know, designed building, um, you know, that's highly sustainable, keeps operating costs low, you know, has a tight envelope. That's all part of what we think, you know, the best product will be in the future for, for any occupant. And, you know, I'll put in the best product category as well. What, what we thought was pretty, you know, pretty cool about the program is that, you know, all of the affordable units and all of the market units um, of which the original intent was to have 40% of all, you know, 380 units to be um, to be affordable. They'll all be blended and they'll all be of the same interior quality in addition to, you know, the building envelope and, and quality. Um, you know, passive house gets a little bit tricky um, and is a whole other level of cost that I think the industry is grappling with how to understand it better so that its costs will come more in line with perhaps what they they might be. But when it comes to you know high rise construction for buildings in Toronto, which has such huge fluctuation in, in climate, um, the cost premiums are are uh, you know outside of the scope of optimization. You know they're they're on the scope of degradation. So I think that it's a stage in time. Like great people like Jordan are studying you know the systems and how to do them um, but more trades need to get up to speed on how to implement and execute and get all that's done because you know the cost for that incremental benefit is so high that you might go well maybe maybe i should 
do something else with this money because it's so expensive. But I think that's changing. Like it's like when Lead first came out, there was a premium that didn't really make much sense. But as people learn how to execute and understand and advise on the systems better, you know, the cost came down. But that's where I directionally feel like we're at right now. Excellent. Next question. It's obvious that a holistic developer prioritizes quality of life for tenants. Jeff, can you speak to the importance of this in your multifamily portfolio? Yeah, I mean, I think like a great building has to prioritize those things. Like, and the buildings we're building, you know, are in, uh, you know, hyper, hyper urban, huge high demand markets. And, you know, they really almost have to be to, to you know, break through where the construction costs are now. You need some support from, from higher rents to kind of validate that. And, you know, it's a competitive marketplace in general and the occupants there want the best of all of those things, you know, quality of life. And in our, in our view, adding affordable units into that mix really helps support that, right? Rather than build the simplest, least expensive building you can that doesn't have all of those quality of life things that, you know, what you could arguably call the luxury consumer would have in its buildings, all the amenities, all the services, all the supports that you need access to things, um, you know, having those wrapped around, like I think it's meaningful, a meaningful difference in terms of quality of life. And it can be, you know, quality of the environment, which is sort of what we're talking about with Passive House, but it's also like, you know, a community and, and a, a place to get together and a place to go. And, you know, units are getting smaller and smaller. So if you don't have those spaces and you just have a, you know, small, tiny unit that you sit in, like it doesn't really add to quality of life. So, you know, the best buildings are doing those things, have those things, are, are learning how to do them better and more efficiently. And, um, you know, and, and a better building that has those things, that has great management, um, you know, will continue to be more valuable in the long term as well, because everybody wants to be in a building that can provide a great quality of life. So, yeah, it definitely attracts a greater group of folks if the building and the and the developer and, and, and the folks behind these developments are focusing on quality of life, amenities and and community. I think that's amazing. Bob, do you have any comments around that? Well, most of our, um, I guess, observations are from a financing perspective and and so we rely a lot on our uh, investors, uh, social housing providers, to to really, uh, you know, gear the the environmental and accessible and and you know the other uh, uh, social impact components, uh, and and we look at those from a finance uh, financing perspective because some of the CMHC programs uh, have requirements. Uh, that, uh, you know, afford you the opportunity to get the most optimal financing. And, and so I've seen now, you know, energy uh, and sustainability at the forefront of our applications and people, uh, uh, proponents meeting those, uh, those qualifications to get the best financing. So that's really our perspective from the, the finance side, is that there is now a conscious effort to achieve, you know, those social goals under the CMHC programs to get uh, 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 the best financing available. Just to tag on to that, Alfredo, like, and, and Bob, like, you know, part of this is whether it's an affordable building or, or whatever building, like really successful developers know exactly what their customer wants. They build that thing, not something else that a customer may want. They know exactly who the customer is and they design for that. And so in the instance of, you know, an affordable building, maybe there are subsidies, maybe there's wraparounds, maybe it's all not for profit. Like, you know, the quality of life needs for that customer may be a bit different than the quality of life needs than from somebody who, you know, is employed, but, you know, is at the lower end of the income spectrum who just wants to be able to live in the right neighborhood and in the right proximity to their employment. Like those are, those can be different needs, right? And so, when we have integrated units, you have to think about that and make sure you have the right services that like support the quality of life because there's a certain segment of the population that like, uh, you know, a, a games room and a fitness gym like is not the first priority like they need services and they need access to those things so really knowing who the customer is you have to know that first and foremost and there's a whole spectrum of that 
based on socioeconomics and also you know geography, right? So it does vary. No, those are all valid points. And you know, for us again on the finance side, what we see is if we see uh, a a good investment on the capital going in to reduce the operating costs, i.e., the direct billings for energy to to a particular tenant, you know, that's that's of value. And it's not just a quality of life, it's actually an affordability component. So if if we can get, you know, deep water cooling to offset uh, and, and create, you know, models under a, a fixed price contract, you know, that is real savings to the occupants. And, and so we've seen that in some of the submissions too. What I'd love to see more of on the financing side is these initiatives, whether it's geothermal, tighter envelope, um, you know, you know, deep water cooling, you know, those things that you're suggesting, like, I just wish there was more capital support for the, at these programs because they don't make pure economic sense, but the federal government and most voters know that these are important things we have to do for the long term of the occupants and for reducing our carbon footprint, et cetera. But, you know, sometimes you get the response, well, I, I can't really give you any loan proceeds for, for doing all those things that are the right thing. You just get points on a scorecard. So it, it really stresses the design. And if we want to be supporting innovation and figuring out how to lower the cost of the, this program by getting more of them done, they need more general support um, from uh, from those programs. That's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, and I know Jordan and Alfredo can jump in on this, but in terms of the Green Energy Fund and other grants uh, that are available, I, I think there are, the programs are there, Jeff. I, I just don't think they're widely known, uh, certainly on the private sector side of the of, of, of construction. But I, I'm pretty sure Alfredo, and, and we're collaborating on some projects now, and he's reaching into those. Uh, and so you have to be knowledgeable if, if, you know, I'm hoping you can add some some color to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, we're talking about how that affects quality of life of the tenants. Uh, you know, from the financing side, to the design side, and and uh, it is challenging to to integrate those aspects because they do have a significant impact on construction costs, and not only construction costs, but construction delivery, because a lot of those items are unique not only to um, the supply chain but also to the authorities who have are familiar with them. So you can't do that in every community. You could only do that in certain communities that uh, you know have gone through the process um, or are more open to it so you know uh, i think it's just you know this is what's a, such a great conversation because there's so many approaches um, to this topic uh, that really lead to a brighter future is really what we're all trying to talk you know what we're talking about today and what we're trying to do so jordan did you have anything to add yeah i think um specifically on the geothermal and i'd say solar energy side there are other mechanisms to get that you know that fine that funding and financing but there are still some regulatory hurdles to making that happen and when you look at the cost benefit we often see it actually makes sense if you can get you know that capital cost underwritten through a cmhc or fcm type funding um that it makes the most sense for that project to take that opportunity on and to to bake that into their, their overall process um, there is going to be a limitation. You know, we see um, net zero ready kind of, kind of definitions coming from FCM. Um, there's a limit on a, you know, on a conventional or on a high performance building, affordable housing building, up like three stories. Beyond that, you're not going to get net zero with onsite generation. Um, and that's when we start to look at other options and other opportunities. Um, we'll talk a bit more about past house later, but um, for those taller structures and, and, and really, you know, what does that model look like? Um, but I think that, you know, what Jeff said about it's got to work within a community, it's got to be integrated within a community context. Um, we can only do so much at the building level and, you know, um, but there are definitely uh, programs in place. I'd like to see more programs, but I think, you know, Jeff hit on that, that, you know, when people start getting these costs and you see the escalation, unfortunately, the geo field or the, you know, the solar array are easy ones to cut. Um, and then, you know, there's a sacrifice in terms of overall efficiency at that point. But there's simple things around the edges and the policy that can that can help, you know, like, and this is Bob lives this every day and he's trying to work through these deals. But like, you know, you'll hear things like, well, like, you know, the payback's actually not so bad, you know, if you consider that the carbon tax is what it is today. And we all, probably everybody on this call thinks it's 
probably here to stay and probably will keep going up over time. And so you sometimes get comments like, well, just consider that in your analysis. Mm -hmm. But none of the programs consider that in their analysis. So, you know, it's hard to, you know, get proceeds for a project that, you know, on paper, the way the government underwrites it doesn't attribute it in any value to those things, even though, you know, the five, four of us might like to say that there's value there. So, um, and as you get bigger projects, these projects become bigger costs, right? And so while there's programs, you know, a $200,000 grant doesn't really matter much if you're trying to build a 500 unit project that, you know, has whatever it is, a 15 or $20 million premium to, to achieve the objectives we all want yeah. to achieve. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, we know, you know, like for CMHC programs, there's a stress test on, you know, finance rates. Um, I don't think there's as much of a stress test on energy rates, right? If you take that model and you say, hey, we're looking at a doubling of gas costs in the next little while, um, that changes the economics quite dramatically. Um, given current utility rates, we have projects that we've developed, um, you know, a business case model to finance the solar, the geo, all the enclosure upgrades over a 25 year horizon, which I realize isn't, isn't a quick payback, but it's a, it's a sustainable um, approach, but you know, that isn't, that's a large upfront capital. And if, if it doesn't fit the funding formula is that, you know, it's be a challenge to, to see the project move ahead. So, yeah. If CMHC would look at that infrastructure, like an asset, assume there are the economics we're talking about and you could secure against that, you know, that, that asset itself, then, you know, the, the worst case is the government owns an asset that it knows that it wants to be building in the first place that has some economics that, you know, people think are pretty likely to happen. It'd be so much easier to unleash like a flood of, of this stuff, you know, on the projects. And we're going to do a bunch of it, which is, uh, you know, optimization, not maximization, because we think it's the right thing. And over the long term, it's going to be a great building. But you get so many people doing it if you could just encourage a structure around it. And uh, the more we're doing it, the cheaper it's gonna get and then all buildings will be doing it. Exactly. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to be fair, I think some of the programs are recognizing that in terms of um, what we're seeing in terms of the formulas, you know, to be able to achieve the CMHC um, energy and carbon performance, we actually have a lot of projects that the way to get there, because there's things such as domestic hot water that are hard to move off of, of gas on, um, is solar photovoltaics and and getting that benefit of at the marginal um, CO2 offset rate. So there are, you know, small scale from an energy use compared to the whole building usage, but they've got bigger knock on impact in terms of uh, compliance and performance uh, of the actual projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let me jump to, um, to Passive House. We kind of highlighted that, that I think the audience would want to know a little bit more. I don't think everybody's familiar with Passive House. So you know, one thing I, this Passive House certification, uh, and just for people's uh, information, Passive House Institute provides the world's most rigorous energy standard with a primary focus on reducing energy, reducing energy use, uh, making buildings airtight, and improving indoor air quality and thermal comfort. Uh, Passive House provides requirements on performance-based system, meaning that they don't tell you how to meet them, just that you only need to meet them. So there are a lot of approaches and flexibility. So Jordan, um, how does this certification have helped you in, in the development of affordable housing? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. And I, and I think um, I, I'll start first a little bit broader and just say that I think any sort of rating program or evaluation program um, is, you know, sort of sets a, a means of accounting for things that aren't typically accounted for in financial models. Um, and I, I had a professor that was, you know, uh, fond of quoting that counting systems change behavior. So, you know, we've all heard of sort of the, the you know, the lead projects where you're point chasing something, we, you know, try to avoid, but um, choosing to go down, you know, passive house and choosing to go for certification um, does start to shape and, and steer a project um, on a certain course. Now, one of the great things about, um, about that is that their emphasis and their focus is on enclosure. So really focused on reducing uh, or, or reducing energy use around, you know, walls, windows, glazing um, to, you know, quite a very significant high effect such that you start to downsize mechanical systems, you start to get, um, you know, sort of uh, unintended benefits from, you know, from that, that level. Um, I think there is still, and, you know, speaking to the maximization, optimization, you know, passive house, especially, you know, PHI in Canada here, 
represents, you know, kind of that maximum level of energy efficiency. Um, and so to, you know, pick on a bit, pick off what Jeff said, there is a cost that comes with that. It's not, not without cost. And so I think um, as we're working through, you know, a rating system like that, um, what it brings is it brings a level of quality assurance. You know, there's a real focus and emphasis on air tightness, um, thermal bridging details, um, early and often analysis of, you know, the energy and how the enclosure of the building goes such that um, there's an increased benefit to the quality of the build and the quality, quality of the design and the quality of the build that comes with the fact that you have to hit this level of certification. And I think that kind of approach, and we've worked with teams that have, you know, taken a project right through to certification and then other teams that have used it as, you know, kind of a design assist. Um, I think when everybody's pulling the same way, that does deliver a higher quality project. Um, there's ancillary benefits around thermal comfort, actual operation, you know, people might not be adjusted to set points as often because they feel more comfortable in a thermally balanced space. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the important message here is you don't have to necessarily get to that, you know, that high level of passive house certification to make huge strides forward with energy efficiency um, and looking at, you know, what that sort of optimum point is for each project. And it's not a one size fits all, um, different projects, heights, density, location, you know, building form factor, all these things influence um, how, uh, you know, how you should balance the energy and, and where you should, you know, be putting that effort into it. Thank you. This Jeff, maybe, Bob, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead, Alfredo. No, I was gonna say, did you have anything to say? <laughs> like my recent experience on this, and I'm not, you know, an engineer, so I'll try to, you know, put it in the parlance that, you know, I've kind of understood it so people can kind of think about it, right? Like, you know, think about spending some extra cost on making sure that, you know, every time there's an opportunity for heat loss or gain through the envelope, there's extra labor there. So that's like something you got to think about. It's just to get that high le higher level of efficiency. So you have some of that complications around design balconies no balconies there's some stress around that it makes it easier if you don't need balconies you can do it with thermal bridging and all these kinds of things but really it's kind of like the, the quality of the envelope so you got a bit of a premium there the, the the seal you know around everything so let's call that a labor premium and then a mechanical premium which i think will come down over time as people know what they're doing and right now when we get prices on some of it it's like people don't understand how it all works. And so they price too much contingency. That's kind of the lead sort of thing. That's what I'm seeing. That stuff is higher right now, but I think that's going to come down. Yeah, I think what you're picking up on, um, and it relates to mechanical equipment, like your, your air handling units, um, as well as glazing systems. Under the PHI or the, you know, the, the Passless Institute version, all those products typically need to be certified and hit these levels. Um, and there's not a ton of suppliers that have them, right? So it's a it's sort of a march forward. Um, I should note maybe at this point that, you know, there are kind of two uh, different systems available under, you know, Passive House. There's PHI, which is, um, you know, the international system. And then there's FIAS, which is a US version. Um, there is a difference in how they account for climate location and, and the thresholds are adjusted depending where you are in climate. So in some cases, um, that can give you a little more latitude to work through it. It just depends on the specifics of the project. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's that is the reality is that there are some additional costs um, that come with it because it's not common practice. Um, that said, where we've seen teams building repeat projects, you know, there's this inherent um, interest in hitting high levels of of air tightness, um, minimizing rework doing that in stages. And, um, you know, I think there's been some interesting results that we've seen, um, even in the Seattle area where they started mandating that, not that you had to hit air tightness level, but that you had to do air tightness testing and, and report it. And so what happened is the, the sort of sub industry there, you know, it became a thing to compete on, right? So contractors are working to see how hot, you know, how low can they go essentially with that. Um, I think that's, you know, that's, it's, it's a point of pride, right? It's, it's, it's workmanship, it's quality. Um, and I, I think regardless of whether you're doing passive house certification or you're trying to do net zero or any of these things, those fundamental core elements of building tight, building well, uh, developing, you know, healthy environment is only going to benefit the, the, the uh, occupants in the long term. But what you're getting at, I think is super important is that the development industry needs to, as we keep learning, right, to take 
what you just said, which other than like 2% of this call, people will be able to understand what the standards are, you know, and put it in something a customer understands. And in some places like Seattle, where they're doing it more, a customer who's lived in either building can tell you like, uh, it's more comfortable. I think it's a, it, it's a better, I like this building more than the one next door to it. But right now we're not there yet because not enough people have been inside of one of those spaces to say that, oh yeah, this is a better building, you know, than the other building. And there's a bunch of fear too, that, well, it might, could it be worse? Like too tight? Is that not a good thing? You know, I get this question from a lot of people, but um what does it mean to the customer um, or lender in Bob's case? Like, I think it's so important to actually be able to communicate that to the customer. Very good point, Jeff. That's interesting. I mean, a lot of the things are still being tested over the long term. I remember, you know, Vancouver when it went through its, um, you know, water leak, uh, you know, uh, enclosure, you know, um, exterior wall problems over you know, a, a long period. And there is this, the whole, a whole new engineering industry got created because of that. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are things I think will be tested over time. And, and great point. I, I can see if somebody lives in the two different types of buildings, I mean, what credibility can, what, what, what other, whatever, what better credibility can you get from that kind of experience and, and that story? Um, would love to jump to another question. Bob, you've been in the industry for over 30 years in both public and private sectors, you've, had, you've seen shifts in priorities from maximization to optimization. How important is the relationship between government and the private sector? Well, it's, it's a tough uh, question to tackle. Uh, if I can start with, you know, uh, not even getting into the uh, private sector and government, uh, um, you know, uh, relationships. Let's stick with just government relationships, federal, provincial, municipal, and how they operate. I, I think we do need to step back and understand that federal policy, when it comes to immigration and training and other stuff that is handled at that level, is impacting provincial and municipal decisions but they're not stakeholders in some case. And so when the federal government tells us, you know, there's 500,000 people coming, 700,000 people coming, and then it's sometimes it's like, okay, city of Toronto or other jurisdictions, what are you going to do about it? Now, I'm not telling, telling you they're not uh, collaborating, but uh, I would say that is a challenge. And we should look at that first and make sure our levels of government are orchestrating policies that they're in control of and then are impacting down uh, uh, downstream decisions. So, you know, everyone should go home and understand that and research and, and see where those impacts are. Now, the P3 stuff, you know, uh, certainly, you know, the Federal Lands Initiative and other provincial initiatives uh, city municipal uh, uh, um, a policy in the city of Toronto with open doors and some sites that have been identified. So everyone is now, you know, being brought along and, and realize that we're sitting on some very valuable land, whether it's held provincially, municipally, or federally, and how we bring that in to the fold. So that's changed over time. There's a, a, a more of an initiative now to use assets that we all own publicly uh, and bring them into production, bring them into uh, all housing, quite frankly. It doesn't have to be uh, just affordable, but certainly uh, as a policy directive, it should go towards the affordable and the social uh, impacts that, that we need to make uh, across the country. So uh, federal lands, uh, provincial, uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunities now with some of their surplus properties. So when I was, you know, uh, um, a part of the public sector, which technically I wasn't, I was a service provider to the public sector. I was dealing with all surplus lands for the province of Ontario, and they were just going out to the highest bidder at the time where I, when I had carriage of that portfolio, which would have been 08, 09, up until 2015. And our mandate as a service provider was get out there and maximize price. There was, there was no view into, well, what can we do with that provincial land bank, right? And, and, and so I think now that has turned. I haven't been in that space now for five, six years. But, but certainly from a, 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 you know, a personal involvement, I, I, you know, we were mandated sell maximize price. 
Yeah, actually funny you bring that up. It was communicated to me the other day that a conversation was taking place with some folks in the nonprofit sector about how, you know, if government only looks to maximize the price of the, the land bank, then how do, we, how do we look at this as an optimal approach for affordable housing over the long term, right? So, you know, great, great comment there. And I think, um, you know, that's something to think about. Jeff, did you have a comment? Well, I'd just like to follow on. That thinking has shifted, right, Bob? Which I think kind of what you're implying, right? Like it's changed so much to the extent that, you know, many of the, the lands that are out there now that aren't even, you know, able to supply deeply affordable land. It's a mix of market and I'll call mid-market affordable. Um, you know, they still don't make much economic sense, you know, with relatively zero land cost base. So, you know, I think all the programs were set up with the best of intentions and some of them intended to work together, but the markets kind of moved away to the point that things are just so much more expensive and the, the need is that much greater. Um, so like to Bob's point, without more collaboration, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot more that needs to be there for not just a developer who's going to make a profit to deliver some of this stuff um, work, but for not for profits to work, you know, like I have so many discussions with groups who are like, well, we thought it cost 60 million, now it costs 80 million. Um, what do we do about the other 20 million that we don't have? I'm like, I think you got to fundraise it or, yeah. you know, um, yeah. you know, Bob can help you get a second mortgage, but like you still have to carry that and the pro forma can't do that because you don't have, you want to keep the rents low. So it's really a tricky time right now. And it's not just for um, those in the private sector. And, you know, obviously, you know, David Olive article is pretty disappointing because, you know, there's obviously a huge relationship with the private sector and the delivery of housing. Um, and there's for sure a segment of the marketplace for the most deeply affordable housing that there's no place for the private sector because we don't understand exactly what the customer needs. And so people can do that on a fee for service basis in the private sector, but otherwise, it, you know, not for profits understand what the specific needs are of their communities and they need to be delivering it. But those groups don't all have the expertise to do it because they haven't been doing it for the last 30 years, really. So that's the problem. You know, I was on a call earlier this week and I, I thought I said something benign, but it turned out to be a little controversial. You know, we, we use this terminology of not for profit NFP status versus a private sector deliver uh, that delivers housing. And, and I, I made a point that that is a tax status. The reality is everyone should have something called retained earnings at the bottom. So whether you call it NFP or not, there should be retained earnings, which means it's at profit. What you do with that retained earnings may then, you know, is based on your social cause, the impacts you want to make, the reinvestment in properties. Let's not forget a lot of the social housing that was built by the city of Toronto, and it's been, it's, it's, this is a true statement, has failed over the years. Lack of uh, uh, money, a sinking fund to do CapEx. And, and now look what's happening. The revitalization of all of that social housing, it's all P3, right? And so Lawrence Heights and all the other projects we see now that Tridale and Daniels are involved with, well, what is that? How do you how do you explain this, this constant chatter about, you know, NFP should do this or, or private sector isn't qualified. I don't buy that anymore, quite frankly. And we, we need to be mindful of how we use that language and, and who's able to better deliver the right product. There's no way an NFP has purchasing power like Jeff does. There's no way an F NFP has the management and the skill set to do the optimal financing. So let's not, you know, uh, I'm a huge proponent. I have lots of NFP uh, uh, clients and, and, and people that I'm working with. All of them today are very mindful of the bottom line. It's not about, you know, just uh, providing full affordability. They're doing optimization by saying, how many market units can I add to supplement the affordable component, right? So I just, you know, we need to be mindful. Uh, we need to be respectful. But, you know, that terminology sometimes connotates the wrong things. 
I want to jump in here because we're, um, it's been an excellent conversation on, on this panel discussion, but we, do, we are moving on to the question and answer, and I want to hand it to Alyssa um, to take us there. Gentlemen, thank you so much, and I'm just going to keep things moving along. So uh, this has been touched on, but I think um, it's important for us to maybe recap or reiterate. So uh, without a doubt, this is a really meaningful conversation with some really great ideas. Um, however, we're living in very unique times with high construction costs. Uh, uh, rising rates. So I guess the question would be, um, if you can sort of walk us through how this gets executed, and specifically the question that came in, how are the cost differenti differentials dealt with on a fairness and shared basis amongst all the parties? So how do we how do we make affordable housing fit the performance and meet the investors' needs. Let me just recap it that way. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot there. I was just trying to wrap my head around the question. Um, I think, you know, Bob can speak to this too, but, you know, uh, uh, investors' capital has different return expectations for, um, you know, the risks that they undertake to, you know, undertake a certain activity. And for sure, there is capital that has probably appetite for higher risk and a little bit lower return to, to, to do some of the things that we're talking about. So, you know, that's where um, we get capital support among internally and amongst our investor group to sort of say, look, yeah, if you can optimize and build a highly resilient um, first class building that has affordable units, like we, we you know, we'll accept a, a lesser return for that rather than foregoing those things, provided that it has you know, positive economics. But, you know, I think that if you think at a really high level about one building that's a market building and one building that's an affordable building and you want to add more affordable rents to your building, um, there's support in the city of Toronto through the Open Door Program. And the support really is help, most helpful in the tax, realty tax exemption that you get. And that alone helps you bring down the rent closer to an average market rent, but depends what your building is. Um, that's number one. And number two, the other program that's supposed to work in conjunction with that program is, you know, programs like the Rental Housing Instruction Initiative, Financing Construction Initiative of RCFI. That, that should further help you, you know, reduce that rent or the number of units that you can charge at that rent um, as a financing subsidy, however, um, that's getting less helpful because of the cost of borrowing the money that is, you know, that's actually risen far beyond what the development yield would be in a case like this. So 12 months ago, those two things combined might let you get to economic returns that, you know, have half of the units at 100% AMR to answer what I think the person's question was. That's sort of changed now and people are dropping 100% AMR units and adding market units as, as Bob said, to try and kind of solve for it. You could bring down the cost by building a, a lesser quality building, which is what you would do if you were a not-for-profit for sure. But the more market units you add, you go, well, I don't know, can I really get full market rent for a unit that, you know, doesn't have any amenities and, um, you know, has all kinds of other things going on in it. So those are like, those are the pressures, but those are like the two big things that have made this work, that made this work in 2021 <laughs> and before. Yeah. But more is probably needed on a supplementary basis to keep that level and keep things viable and you know to add more. Um, Perfect, thanks Jeff. I think that's a really good recap. Um, next question, Bob, maybe you can take this one. Uh, what do you think about programs like Habitat for Humanity or other NFP agencies such as these uh, that are getting into real estate development? Well, so I'm familiar with some of their projects. Uh, they're uh, primarily, Habitat is primarily in a rent-to-own model. Uh, there's other groups that have pioneered that. Uh, Options for Homes, I think, has been around probably the longest uh, that I recall in my career. And so there's new programs out now. Uh, Vancouver, I, I, I saw a bunch that are, are new to me in terms of how they're being financed. I think there's private sector capital coming in to finance that. Um, 
you know, I, again, we have uh, uh, um, an entity that is good at something. And, and I'm going to make a very broad point here, and maybe it'll, it'll answer part of the question. When you look at any business in commerce, you look at a retailer, a manufacturer, and you look at what do they do best? Do they do real estate ownership and management best, or do they do their business best? Let's, let's think about that, because as an NFP, if your value add and your knowledge is how to operate, stick to being an operator and, and, and work with the private sector on bringing it to market, uh, uh, perhaps creating a sinking fund to make sure it operates. I, I, I really think there's more merit in making sure we're all not, you know, not sticking in our lane, but using our core competencies. It's very important to use our core competencies. And sometimes we have entities that want to be real estate owners, but they're very good at something else. Thanks, Bob. Um, this might be another one for you uh, specifically. And gentlemen, if uh, anyone else has a view, can step in. Uh, is there a role for green bond financing in these projects? Well, um, th there's a role for all types of financing. Even Peak Hill is kind of early for, for me to say this, but we're exploring right now setting up a, a an affordable uh, uh, program on the lending side. So we, we are trying to get capital from impact investors institutions to lend at, at more favorable rates, knowing the product, knowing that return expectations are. I don't think there's a lack of financing, quite frankly. I think there's a lack of understanding of, of how the entities can, can live together and coexist. I think really that's where the challenge is. And, and CMHC, uh, not everyone understands CMHC's role. And, and if, if that's part of the question and answer later, I'll, I'll get into that. But a lot of people have a misunderstanding of, of CMHC's role. You know, for this discussion, they have two very significant roles. They are a direct lender under uh, the National Housing Act, you know, offering money under our CFI co-investment, there's grants, there's a whole bunch of great programs. But our role in, as PQ, we're, we're, we're an approved lender. Uh, we underwrite, we obtain COI, and then we're the actual lender. And, and, and so that distinction, you know, needs to be made of, of whose capital is being used, who the participants are. But I don't think there's a shortage of capital, quite frankly. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like a lot of people raise this, right, Bob? Like, well, you know, in the 80s, there were programs to get more capital into the space. So that's what we need. There is not a lack of capital right now. You know, we have a ton of money sitting here waiting to do all of the things we're talking about. It's about making the um, making the economics pencil a little bit better, ensuring that whatever supports are required to have. Because like, we can't do these things one at a time, right? We need to create the foundation for an industry to evolve and grow so that people like Alfredo can do, you know, 20 buildings a year and, you know, not one a year and, you know, more, more uh, developers in the space and lenders, you know, emerge because there's an industry that's supported, not on a one-off grant basis. You should get this thing because you don't really get, you know, economies of scale with the people skills, but the capital is there. Like, there's no question that, uh, that uh, you know, Bob and ourselves can, you know, have lots of money available, willing to do the right thing and willing to probably price itself, uh, you know, appropriately with what needs to be done. Yeah, and Jeff, you talked about a risk reward. I, you know, quite frankly, and maybe I'm saying this uh, glibly, but, uh, you know, the, the risk in these projects is not as great as we're penciling as business people. You know, uh, the grants available, uh, the social, uh, 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 you know, impacts that are being made, no one's going to let that program fail after you build the building, right? So I really don't believe the risk is as high as we underwrite sometimes. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, just to include Jordan in the conversation here, you know, one of the things to consider too is scale of building. Like, you know, all our conversation is GTA focused usually and trying to build 300, 400 unit buildings I don't think that's the path forward in my view. And, and I think 
optimally uh, in terms of energy sustainability, uh, these capital programs probably have a sweet spot that is closer to 100 units mid-rise. Uh, uh, and, and, and I don't think we're mindful of that. We all think about, let's get a patch of dirt in Toronto and put off 40 door, 400 doors. That's not the model we need to roll out across the country. Uh, I think 70 to 100 units of intensification, you, you know, you, you, you can access the right amount of capital. Your budget may vary maybe 3 to 4% versus 5 to 10% on the capital side that's required to make these efficiencies. So we have to be mindful of that. We're good for 400 units, by the way. <laughs> No, I think that is, I, I think I said earlier, so it's not a one size fits all. I think the question there about green bonds, I think the, the key thing is keeping those interest rates low and being able to have a long horizon on, especially for renewable energy and, and geothermal technologies. It's a, you know, it's a long-term investment. So if that's a mechanism that overlays, you know, the, the other initiatives, I think that's, you know, that's a great, great opportunity there. All right, gentlemen. Um... Before we wrap up, uh, this has been just an excellent conversation. I'd like to give each of you the opportunity to uh, give us uh, your final words of wisdom. And uh, Jordan, we'll, uh, we'll start with you. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, I think that the important thing here is um, there isn't a one size fits all uh, approach, as I've said. And um, I think really understanding the, uh, the context of the building, the location, how it's gonna consume energy, Having a focus and emphasis on on occupants, uh, occupant health and wellness, uh, will hold you in good stead, regardless of how you you know you you approach deploying uh, these different technologies and systems. Um, I think the the final thought there is just a lot of these technologies are not new. Um, they've been with us a long time, and they are mature. And I think even though there's maybe a smaller subset of of you know conventional contractors familiar with it, that that, that shift is happening and that's changing. Um, and I think that's positive for for optimizing these projects going forward. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I think I would just leave with a general positive note because I find that sometimes um, these conversations and those listening can can think, uh, you know, that there are sides to this. Like I think anybody who's willing to take time, effort, energy, and attention to try and make an impact in a problem that we're having across Canada, there's space for all of this stuff. I'd like to think that not-for-profits and the private sector can work together because we've done that effectively, you know, over decades, you know, in, in this country. And I think we'll continue to do it again. But, um, you know, please continue to support anybody who's uh, trying to do the right thing and make some of this stuff happen. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Bob? Uh, just two parting comments, I guess. One is, um, you know, housing is a supply chain, and people forget that. We're all participants. Uh, the engineering, the sciences, the, the capital, the operators, the innovators like Alfredo, like we're a supply chain and, and we shouldn't start poking at each of you know those, those components of the supply chain. We all have a place, we all have a part to play. I think we will succeed better if we look at it as a supply chain, not just he has to solve it, she has to solve it. I, I, I think that's an issue that I've seen. And then the last comment I'd like to make is that, and here's a challenge for the province of Ontario. When you look at uh, large scale operators and, and people that have ideas and innovation, why should they go to each municipality and argue and fight about DCs, taxes and the rest of it? There should be one rule one rule for every municipality in Ontario or across any other provincial jurisdiction. And that way, that developer, that operator, they know exactly the model they're going to roll out. You're not wasting time. You're not renegotiating and reinventing every single time. And that's for our province to solve. No city, the city of Toronto should not be, you know, uh, you know mandating or, or doing something that is totally totally anathema to creating affordable housing. Thanks, Bob. And Alfredo, I'll pass it back to you. Well, hey, thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate the passion and the conversation as well about this topic. It's been an incredible discussion today about optimization versus maximization. So at this time, on behalf of 3H Properties, I'd like to extend our gratitude to yourself, Jeff, Bob, and Jordan. Uh, for taking the time today to participate with us in this chat and share your stories and your wealth of knowledge with us. Um, 
to show our gratitude, 3H Properties has made a contribution to the Foundations for Social Change, a Vancouver-based charitable organization that develops innovative programs helping vulnerable populations in our communities. We picked this organization because it speaks to the values that align with our shared ethos. Bound by our shared humanity, it is our responsibility to build an inclusive society where everyone has the opportunity to achieve their full potential. Thank you again, everybody uh, and yourselves to uh, speaking with us today. And with that, I'll pass it back to Alyssa. Thanks, Alfredo. Um, thanks again for everyone attending and thank you to our very special guests here today. Looking forward, uh, 3H Properties will be hosting uh, another webinar in the new year to dive deeper on um, optimization versus maximization and many other exciting topics. Uh, more information will be made available in the coming weeks on 3H's social media uh, and through our database. Uh, thank you very much for joining. If anyone has any outstanding questions, please feel free to reach out to uh, the individuals here. Uh, I'm sure all of you are on LinkedIn uh, or you can track me down on LinkedIn and I'll make sure that uh, your questions get answered. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.